Judy Prince, my wife, said, why don't you do a show about kids? And I thought, you know a play you used to just love was Merrily We Roll Along? And so he suggested to me, and I knew the play and thought it was a swell idea. This is Steve Sondheim, everybody. Steven Sondheim and Hal Prince, they were like, of course, my idols. They were the gods of Broadway. They were one. There was the casting notice that they were having open calls for a new Sondheim show, and they wanted young people. Come on! There were 5,000 people that auditioned, or more 12,000, I think, maybe. Steve Sondheim, Hal Prince, who else could have been in that room? Christ and Moses, or... <laughs> I mean, the good news is that, uh, is that you're all in the show. Oh! I've never been happier rehearsing actors. I've never gone home sure that a show was going to be a success. I thought, this is just it. I just didn't feel for these characters. Funks, lurches, and on several occasions, faints dead away. I've never seen rows of people bleed. Here was my chance to write about these heroes of mine, and I knew the show would fail. It was a painful piece to write. That was the day before I was fired. It was like we are flying, and then suddenly we crash. What just happened here? It was the hostility that had built up towards Hal and me, and I thought, I got to get out of this. That play was all about those who follow their dreams, those who have just bad breaks, those who have good breaks. And so I would have thought that's the way it's going to work out for all these kids. There's good stuff, we'll do that. And it says try out. This show, if I never do anything again in the rest of my life, I will have had this moment. You know, there's only a few moments in your life that are, are truly transcendent. It was one of the better things that ever happened to me. I'm totally choked up. I feel so I emotionally that. involved. And I can't even imagine how you must feel having lived it. Yeah, uh, uh, maybe less emotionally involved than you today. I don't know. <laughs> um, I've, you know, I've obviously worked on the film a long time. And so, yeah, I haven't seen the trailer for a while. So it was very cool to see it again. Okay, so... Lonnie Price, you're the director of this film, yes. but you're also one of the stars of the film, yeah. and in a way, you're two of the stars of the film, because yeah, yeah, we yeah, have yeah. current Lonnie, right, right. and we have younger... With Lonnie. hair Lonnie. <laughs> hair Lonnie, yeah. right. yes. Which, look at these side-by-side -side pictures. Yeah, scary, um, isn't it? Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yep. There, there is love in both of those shots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, those uh, are my pals, too, so it's very cool. Uh, to have known them for 35 years, so we go back a long time. So I want to talk about the history of the documentary. I want sure. to talk about the history of the show. Yeah. But first, I want to talk about your history with Hal Prince and Stephen Sondheim. Right. You were, as we now say, a total fanboy. Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. Absolutely. When you were growing up, you wrote Stephen Sondheim a fan letter, right? I did, yeah. How old were you then? Uh, 14? 13 or 14? 14, and probably, yeah. And he ignored it, right? No, he wrote back. Of course, he wrote he back. And really, silly of him is he put his return address on the envelope, which was a big mistake. Did you go go visit him? No, no, but I wrote to him again, and you know we had a very, very sweet kind of pen pal relationship for, uh, well, a long, long time. Yeah. Please tell me you still have those letters. I do. Yeah, sure. Yeah, oh somewhere. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You don't throw a Stephen Sondheim letters. You, you, you keep those. I yeah. would hope not. Yeah. And then you wrote, a couple of years later, you wrote a letter to Hal Prince. Sure. I wrote to Hal and just said I wanted to work for him. And uh, he said, come on up. And I was going to Performing Arts High School at the time, which was then on 46th Street. And so after school, I went up. And they were in the middle of, well, they were preparing uh, Pacific Overtures, the uh, show they did about the opening of Japan. So I stuffed envelopes and kept scripts up to date and got to be at the recording session, which was mind-blowing. And uh, yeah, they, they, Hal gave me the run of the theater, which was the Winter Garden. And uh, it was just, you know, a fantasy. It was just ridiculous that I was getting the access and to be near their process was really extraordinary. Do you feel like the letter you got back from Stephen Sondheim empowered you to make that ask for a job of Hal Prince? Uh, sure, yeah, I guess so. Um, you know, the truth is, is people keep asking about those letters, but I, I, I kind of thought, well, the worst that could happen is I won't hear from them, but it was, it, it didn't take a lot of courage or I was just a really uh, young kid with a lot of chutzpah and moxie, and it just, it just, it just was like, 
I'm going to write to them. So, uh, and by the way, I sort of encourage people to do that. You know, I mean, write to people. You'd be surprised how. And your address <gasps> is. Ah. Uh, <laughs> they have to do the work to find it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's true. But once you do, um, you know, people. I'm very impressed with people that take the time to do that, and I'm always happy to talk to them or you know have a coffee with them or something that they made that effort. Uh, so anyway, uh, it, it's um, the other thing is that Hal Prince was mentored by George Abbott, the great George Abbott. So he had a, um, a history and a love of mentorship. So when I wrote to him, I knew that. And he kind of took me under his wing. And, um, you know, I've known him now for uh, 40 years, mm -hmm. more than 40 years. And that's extraordinary because I'm only 35. So <laughs> it's kind of a trick. Well, one thing that I think is so remarkable about, I mean, there's so much that's remarkable about this story. But one of the things that gives me the most pause is the fact that you were basically an administrative assistant, and yeah. then you went to starring in his show. Like, can you imagine even allowing one of your interns, like a, a, someone stuffing envelopes, to audition to star in one Pretty of your weird. shows? weird. Well, I think that happened because, you know, he was, look, I was, um, when I worked for him, I was 15, mm -hmm. and the show was about kids. And uh, there was just sort of this initial reading that they wanted to see if the material would land on, because you know we played backwards in time. We started at the age of 40 and wound up being our own ages or close to it by the end. So you just wanted to see how kids would sound doing material written for 40 year olds. And uh, he called uh, Joanna Merlin, his casting director, whom I'd known, said just, you know, this little reading, just come up and, and I read a couple of pages and he said, sure. And just because I had had access, he knew me. And um, yeah, it is kind of remarkable when you think about it. I've never thought about it that way, but I was, you know, an actor at that point and thought, and it was years later. I mean, I was already like, tw I was 20. I mean, oh, I was so you old. were on the old end of yeah. these. It was five years later, so I was not, you know, and I had, you know, gone to Juilliard and all that. So I was, and working as a professional actor, so it didn't seem as weird at that time. Got it. He didn't just pluck you from the mailroom and yeah, stick no, you no, in no, the no, center no, of no. I was already kind of, you know, establishing myself as an actor best I could. Um, you actually start the film with, uh, in, in, a, we, in a way, the film also goes backwards in time. That's it right. starts with um, you as, a, as your current age and then works backwards in the final, spoiler alert, the final scene is you guys as kids all together um, during the production. Um, this documentary might not have ever been made if a different documentary hadn't been begun back in 1980. Yeah, yeah. Or in, uh, in 1981, when we started the show, ABC News had like a magazine show called Close Up. And they were doing a segment on the making of a Broadway show. And they chose Merrily because Hal and Steve had just done Sweeney Todd and, you know, companies. This was a Bollies guaranteed and, hit, this show. I mean, yeah, absolutely. And uh, so they started and they followed. Uh, they went all the way through uh, auditions, but they did some meetings with Hal and Steve and they did auditions and some interviews and stuff. And then they realized that ABC Corporation had an investment in the show. And since this was a news documentary, it was considered a conflict of interest, probably wouldn't be considered now. And they pulled it. And so, um, and they told everybody that they destroyed the footage because um, they didn't want to pay the SAG rights to people. Anyway, so. For 35 years, I sort of went, I think it exists. And we started making the movie without it, mm. interestingly enough. And uh, we had an investigator find it. And uh, and the guy, when I met him, he said, I think you have a 9% chance of finding this material. <laughs> that seems like a weird number. And I just, But it was so weird for me because I just said, I know it exists. I just, I know it exists. So they went and they typed in, it was at ABC News, and they typed in all these things to see you know, what would pop up. And... Broadway and Hal Prince and Steven Sondheim and Alvin Theater and Mute, nothing, nothing, nothing. And they went back a final time and they typed in B Way, B apostrophe W A Y, and 37 boxes of film popped up. They'd been sitting in a mountain in Connecticut for 35 years, untouched. And they, and you'll see in the film that you see when I get the footage, it's. It's this gold. It's the holy grail. The, so I was so lucky to get it. The scene that shows you opening those boxes for the first time and you pull out this giant reel-to-reel -reel and you go, this is my interview. Yeah, yeah. It's me at, at 20 years old in my parents' apartment right up there, 8th Street and Broadway. By oh, the my way. gosh. Like right really here. right there. Yeah, we could um, see in your old window. Yeah, yeah, here. practically, practically. Um, and uh, talking about my dreams of the theater and my dreams for my life. And uh, it's very... Uh, uh, you know, it's sort of like meeting yourself, and it's almost like a different person. You know, you're meeting someone who you were 35 years ago. It's, um, 
It's kind of freaky. We got to watch you watch those yeah, tapes. Um, and by the way, the documentary is going to be released in theaters in New York on November 18th, and then it's going to expand across the country. I highly yeah. recommend that everybody see it. I had read about it, heard about it, was excited about it, knew some of this story, but until I saw it, uh, I don't, I mean, you know, I'm, I told you that, I warned you there would be gushing on the stage, and I really just couldn't, I can't say enough about this. My favorite scene, I think, I don't know, there's so many, but one of my favorite scenes is you reacting to your 20-year-old self yeah. on camera, and this guy's saying, if I never do anything else with my life, it won't matter, because this show is everything. This is the destination. So often we hear, it's the journey, not the destination, and yet you had a moment in your life that felt like the destination. Yeah, well, it's like a little kid who wants to be an astronaut, you know, and NASA says, okay, you're going to the moon tomorrow, and, uh, you know, it's, it was the most extraordinary thing. I mean, it was beyond, and also, you'll, I'll never be that age again, so I don't think anything will ever mean that much to me as it did when I was 20. I mean, it's, uh, it was my entire thing, so it was extraordinary. Do you remember what you said about your reaction to that 20-year-old guy? Uh, in the film? Uh-huh. Uh, I think what I said was I'm glad not to be embarrassed by him. Yeah. I thought I would be. I thought, oh, he's just gonna be some theater nerd. He's just gonna be just like, oh. And um, I thought, it's interesting, you forgive yourself for your youth at a certain age. You look back and you go, oh, he wasn't so bad. Why didn't he like himself more? You know, I think you look at pictures of yourself when you're younger and you think, oh, I thought I was so fat or whatever. And you go, I wasn't so bad. Why did I not appreciate who I was as much? And when you're older, you go, oh, he was okay. So uh, that was kind of um, a healing to look at him and not think, um, oh, uh, I would be embarrassed by him. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm glad. But it's so interesting. It feels like he's someone else. You know, it's... Uh, He's that guy, but it, I know he's me, but it's so long ago, it almost doesn't seem like me, and it does at the same time. It's very, it's very weird. You seemed like a, like a proud dad, kind yeah, of, Yeah, moment. it's funny. Yeah, it's that weird, yeah. I'm sort of proud of the kid I was, or at least as not embarrassed by him, which was good. Well, one of the themes of the show, of Merrily, like you said, it's kids playing older versions of themselves, and then they slowly uh, age backwards to become the actual kids. And the great thing about this documentary is that we're able to sort of see that process in reverse. We're able to see the actual kids become the adults that they are destined to become. The show, the point of it, I think, is to for, for kids to realize those moments of potential and how much they have ahead of them. To, uh, one of the actors says that the hardest thing about growing old is, that, is seeing young people who don't appreciate what they have. And what and they're building, that each choice that they make is going to lead someplace, and it's not random. Do you know what I mean? That you, you are where you are because of the, the path you've chosen. And I think also most people, I, I'm in my 50s now, if you'd asked me when I was 20 that I would, where would I be, it certainly wouldn't be a director of that documentary. You just don't know what you're going to become. Well, one of that's, and that's one of the themes of the show. That's I wonder, right. having been involved in it as a kid, as a, you know, you were 20, some of the other uh, actors were in their teens, did you absorb any of that? Were you able to appreciate your youth and your potential and all of the places no. you could go? No. no? Not at all. No, no. I was just so happy to be doing the show. And no, I, I don't think any of that dawned on me. We, we start the, the movie saying that um, life can only be lived, and I'm, not, I'm forgetting who the quote is, life can only be lived forwards, but it can only be understood backwards. Mm. So you can only be someplace now and look back and go, oh, that's why this happened. You don't know it while you're doing it. You know it in retrospect. So whatever age you are, if you're 20 now, you look at your 10-year-old self and go, oh, right, why I wound up doing this was because at 11 I decided to do that. And uh, the journey kind of gets um, decided for you by the choices you make. You have some really intimate conversations with your former castmates yeah. who it appears have really remained close friends mm. over the course of the years, even if you've distant, you know, had distance between you. Do you think that you were able to get more out of them as a director because you shared the experience with them? Sure, yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that they were very um, willing to be very honest and to you know, show the warts and the pain of what their lives, you know, as in everybody's life, has great times and also sad times. They were able to I think, um, share that with me. And further, I felt an obligation to share mine with them. I mean, mine in the movie. You know, you can't ask people to be vulnerable and uh, tell me about uh, your disappointments in life without also being one of the people that says, 
you know, here are mine. So it was, um, and initially when we started making the movie, I didn't want to be in it. I wanted it to be about them. And uh, after a while, it was pointed out to me that that was not fair. It can't be about them if it's not about you. Look at you. Yeah, yeah, I'm sort of in the middle of it. So it's hard to, you know, it's hard to escape. But um, it took a long, the movie took nine years to make. So it was not good for a really long time. And, uh, but we had a great producer, Bruce Klein, who just believed in it and kept saying, keep going. I think there's a movie in there. And finally, I think we found one that we all feel proud of. Well, you should feel proud of it. Thanks. Um, can you tell the story about the party that you had that you didn't expect Hal Prince to come to? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, it was well, around your birthday, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, we had a... Um, yeah, uh, uh, th there was um, there was a party uh, that we were throwing. The show was postponed for five months. And... Um, the show was supposed to be on five months, and so we got together and did sort of uh, parties together to get to know each other because we had all this time. And uh, two of the people, I, I had a birthday coming up, and one of the leads had a birthday coming up, and we sort of made this party. And uh, someone said, why don't you invite Hal Prince, the producer and director, and Stephen Sondheim, the composer. And I said, oh, he's not going to come. You know, why would they come to our party? And I called Hal, and he said, yeah, we'd love to come, and we're bringing Steve. And they showed up at that building oh my gosh. right there. And I threw my parents out of the apartment. You know, I said, you're totally embarrassing. I can't have you here. <laughs> and we had this dessert party. And then um, Stephen Sondheim uh, said, do you have a piano? And I said, yeah. And he went into my room and on my childhood piano played the score of Merrily for the Which, cast. by the way, this, this room was covered in posters. Of his shows. Of his yeah, shows it was totally embarrassing. we still such a fanboy. <laughs> Completely and utterly embarrassing. And he played, and, and then, which was very sweet, he said, I know it's your birthday. And I went, yeah. And he said, so this is a kind of birthday present for you. And he played the song Good Thing Going as a gift for me to sing in the show. So, again, it was, it was going to the moon. It, it was, and that part of it was not unnoticed by me or recognized. Like, this is awesome. What is happening is crazy. And I kept thinking I was going to wake up. I kept thinking, oh, no, this isn't, this couldn't be real the most incredible thing about that story is that you pressed record on your tape deck. Of course I did. So that that is that that it's sound is actually yeah, yeah, in yeah, the yeah. film. Yeah, it's extraordinary. And we get to hear you going, that was the best birthday present I've ever gotten. And Stephen Sondheim says, it better have been or I'm giving it to somebody else. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And I think he might have been serious. I think someone else might have sang Good it. thing you liked it. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that was, um, yeah, they were in extraordinary moments. But yeah, no, I, again, the tape recorder was there because I knew how special this was. I, it wasn't like, because some people in the film go, I didn't know what we had. And I was just such a theater kid. I, I, I knew how ridiculously special this was. And so I appreciated it a lot and was present for it a lot. So this show, unfortunately, was a notorious flop, or maybe at this point, not so unfortunately. No, it's, well, but it's a huge success now. You know, I mean, they've reworked it and it's done all the time and all over the place and won the Olivier Award in London. And I mean, it's a huge hit now. It's just the initial production was not received well and they worked on it a lot and it's, you know, it's now a big hit. So. It's just this first outing of it was, was treacherous for them. Do you think you would have the relationship you still clearly have with your former castmates? Had the show had a good, long, solid run and no, people had left not. one by one? And mm, probably not. No, I think, you know, we went through a war. You know, I think we went through something. We, had, uh, we postponed the opening three or four times. We had five or six weeks of previews. You switched out your leading man right before Leading man, the night. choreographer went. I mean, it was a lot of carnage on the show and we all had to sort of bond and sort of huddle and think uh don't let them fire me and uh luckily they didn't but uh it was it was scary but we were also very protected by them they never made us feel like the problems in the show had anything to do with us and they were supportive and you know we were kids i mean we were from the age of, abby was 15 and the oldest person was 25 and they had a very paternal feeling about us and um something very sad is you know uh, the show did not run and i remember how prince the director came to my dressing room like the night after we opened and he said um i'm really sorry i didn't give you a hit he said i think i gave you a good show but i wanted to give you a hit and i'm sorry i didn't give you a hit and it was heartbreaking for me to hear that even at 22 which is what i was by that time and think you know you've given me this amazing gift and that you feel guilty that um, it wasn't received better, but to me it was glorious. And uh, But they have held that, both Hal and Steve, and they talk about it in the film. Uh, 
feeling more guilt that the show wasn't a hit because we were kids, mm -hmm. that they didn't give the ki they didn't give the kids a hit, you know. And uh, I think they to this day feel very sorry about it. Do you think that the experience would have been different if they had cast? 25 to 35 year olds instead of 15 to 25? Well, the whole idea was kids. Right. I mean, there, the initial production, the whole idea was that we were kids and that we would not, we would play the stories of people older than we were who be, had become somewhat bitter, disillusioned people. And that by the end of the show, when we were our own ages, the, the uh, audience would look at those people, the cast themselves, and say, oh, they're young, they didn't make those mistakes, they may be the generation that has learned from their parents' generation and will change the world and not make the mistakes of their parents. So it was kind of this great meta idea, right. and it had to have kids because that was the idea. I get that, but I also saw the show at Encores, which starred Lin-Manuel Miranda and Celia Keenan-Bolger, and they were in their 20s, and I didn't feel like the fact that they weren't kids took away from any of that. Of course, that was many years later and the show was well known and had well, become it's a It's very diff differently structured as well. But that was, Hall that was Hall and Steve's initial idea mm -hmm. of what it is. And so I I, it's hard for me to know if it's better or worse this way. But uh, it, it's done in colleges a lot, which I think says a lot. Yes, yeah. definitely. I have a question about the editing process for the movie. Oh, okay. I noticed, and I'm curious whether this was on purpose, but the first half of the movie is all about um, sort of the ramp up to opening night and all of this joy and anticipation. And then the second half is is the uh, sort of the aftermath of opening night and that that New York Times review that in arguably kind of killed the production. I noticed that that opening night moment, that curtain, happens at exactly halfway through the movie. 48 oh, wow. minutes before, ah, 48 minutes after. That's interesting. Is that a total coincidence? Total coincidence. Well, congratulations. Thank you very your... much. <laughs> I feel so proud of it now. No, no, we didn't. No, no, it actually is a total coincidence. But uh, that's interesting. I'll watch it next time I'm thinking about that. Yeah, I was looking at the little, and I thought, I thought half positive, half bittersweet. Um, so you said this movie took nine years to make. Nine years. When did you actually wrap the film? Oh, gosh, I don't know, maybe a couple of months ago. Oh, really, recently? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It was endless. It was endless. <laughs> Went through four editors. It was endless. I, you know what? I'd never made one before, and I didn't know what I was doing. And I'm a slow learner, apparently. And uh, so it just took a long time, and each, each cut would get a little better, and then it wouldn't, and it would, and... Um, I just believed in it a lot, and um, I got lucky that the people around me believed in it too. So uh, we just kept plugging away at it. I'm so glad you did. I, I, I appreciate your saying you got lucky, but I also think this is a true example of continuing to put hard work into something until you get it to be what you want. Oh, thank you, Laura. We unfortunately are running out of time. We do have time for a, a couple of questions from the audience. I'm sure. gonna steal one of those questions to ask you about Sunset Boulevard starring Glenn Close that you are directing. Yes, it's coming yes. to Broadway. Yeah. So in two sentences, tell us everything. Aha. Um, she's extraordinary. Uh, it's a very different production. It's. Um, it doesn't have uh, all of the grandeur and glamour. It's it's uh, much more about just the relationships of the people, um, and uh, I'm very proud of it. I'm really excited. It's going to be here, and we're bringing over the uh, the uh, London uh, companies. The, the the leads from London will all be here, and they're amazing. And um, so I'm looking forward to seeing them again. And we go into rehearsal uh, first week of January. So actually, I'm playing hooky from casting. They're casting right now. And so oh, yeah. uh, I'm supposed to be there, but don't tell them I'm, I'm I'd rather there. have I'm you here there. with me anyway. Yeah, I'm not there. Um, this is just the latest in a storied history of you directing the biggest stars, female stars on Broadway, Patti Lapone and, uh, Emma Thompson and Kristen Chenoweth. And I feel like I'm forgetting somebody. Maybe. Oh, those are enough. Yeah. That's well, a, yeah, in, yeah. in any case, yeah. everyone. Um, and so, uh, I'm just, Big fan and excited Thank you're you. here. Uh, let's so turn sweet. it over to the audience for some questions. Hey, Lauren. yeah, hi. Thank you for being here. Uh, sure. How was it premiering the movie at the New York Film Festival? Oh, it was so amazing, man. It was so great. I mean, first of all, you know, most people are going to watch it on their phones or their, you know, their watches or something. You know, these days, and to <laughs> see it in that huge theater with that big screen and the surround sound is 1,200 seats. You know, when it goes in the films, it'll be in little theaters. So it was really really a thrill, and Steve was there, Sana was there, and the cast was there, and they'd never seen it. So it was great to be there with the cast watching it for the first time, and uh, yeah, it was, 
it was beyond thrilling. Thanks for asking that. It was one of those moments I'll never forget. It's great. Hey, Lonnie, I actually saw it at the film festival, and I loved it. Oh, um, good. And I love um, the company movie, too. But I wanted to ask, you directed one of my favorite episodes of Triumph and Jack that Julie Klausner and Curtis Squin wrote, and I want to know how you, what road took you to Triumph to work Oh, with uh, um, you know, it, I, it's, it's kind of, I don't know quite how I got that job. Um, I love Triumph. I mean, I love, I, I, do you remember him on the Tony Awards, uh, the red carpet of the Tony Awards? you got to YouTube that. It's Hilarious. I mean, he calls it the which it's the who's who of the who cares. I mean, it's just so <laughs> so irreverent and mean and hilarious. Um, I don't know. I, I I didn't know Bob, and I just I, I, it's it's a dumb answer. I just got a call and was so glad glad to do it. And I'm glad you like the episode. Uh, they're amazing. He's amazing with that puppet, and he's really cruel. I mean, the try stay. You don't want to meet Triumph in a dark alley. He is a nasty dog. So, uh, but I had a great time with them. They're they're great people. Uh, hi, Lonnie. Hey. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Um, my friend Gary was in the original cast. Gary Stevens. Yeah, Gary Stevens. I know him. Um, he's an awesome dude, and I know the film really means a lot to him. Yeah. So I was wondering whose reaction from the cast or the production team uh, either surprised you most or really just, like, blew you away upon them seeing the film. Well, um, I was a little scared showing it to them because, you know, it's representing their lives. And, um, but uh, Gary seemed to love it. Um, I, I, I've been sort of lucky in that I haven't gotten, you know, maybe somebody doesn't like it, but m everybody that I've spoken to who's seen it uh, in the company really seems to love it. And I think in a way, because the show lasted such a short time, it, um, it gives them a place in history for those people particularly who didn't, don't act anymore. And it makes it like they did something special that will be remembered. So I think mostly they're really happy with it. But honestly, so far, I have not heard anybody who said, why'd you do that? I don't like the way you showed me. And you no, know, everybody's been really excited by it. So if I hear anything, I'll let you know. But no, nothing so far, nothing so far. Well, it is truly a love letter, not only to the show, but to the people who are involved, to the industry as a whole, uh, to this strange roller coaster of w the way that something that can look like a terrible thing can turn into a wonderful thing. I I'm so glad you put all nine years into the project because it really is exactly what it needed to be. And as a lover of the theater, I'm so glad that this exists. And I want to thank you, Lonnie Price, thank for you, being Laura, here so today. Thank you, Laura, so much. Thanks so much. Thank you, guys.